Hello again, welcome to week six lecture on experimental design and testing means and group differences using t-test and ANOVA. In this week's lecture, we're going to divide this into three sections. The first is looking at experimental design in general, and then the section two will focus on uh, t-test, and then we're going to look at ANOVA for the section three. We're gonna look at what is experiment, different type of experiments, the strengths of weaknesses, and then how we're going to conduct different types of statistical analysis using T-Test ANOVA and some uh, ethical issues. So in this part, we're going to look at an overview of experimental methods. Experimental methods exist everywhere. Um, a lot of policymakers rely on experiments to know which policy works better. The medicine that we consume or the vaccine that we use is also the result of many experiments that the scientists have done. Um, even our learning approach is also a form of experiment that the professors have used to test different ways to see which uh, technique or learning or teaching method that produces the better results. I just want to highlight here one example of what we call A-B testing. So A-B testing is a very simple type of experiment. For example, this has been used by uh, Barack Obama, the former US president, in his online campaign to seek a donation. So if you look at the picture on my left, that was their original version of their website in which they get people to, to look at the website and to hopefully to donate to his uh, campaign. So basically he has only a sign up, look at the red, red at the bottom, a red sign up button and a very simple, original photo of himself, Barack Obama. So, so on the on the left side, this is what we call the, the, the original version. So in the A-B testing, so they wanted to know if, if they want to test this in different ways. So this is a little bit more complicated than just A-B testing. So what you want to do is you want to know if you have different types of buttons and different type of media images, can you test this to know which one works better? So for example, in a study done by this consultancy firm called Optimizely, they did 24 combinations or 24 factorial designs. That because they have four type of button, right? From sign up, join us, learn now, sign up now. And they have six types of uh, the media from the original family image until the Springfield video. And you have different combinations of this that provides 24 different combinations. And then you will randomly show people who visit this Obama's website. You randomly, when they click, you can randomly tell the computer to show one of the random of this one of these 24 combinations and let them interact with it. And then with that, they have tested it and they know that there is certain type of this uh, sort of um, form that will uh, capture more people's attention or get people's more to, to support that particular campaign. So at the end, from the original version, they pick the winner. So the winner is the one on my right, which has a learn more button. Remember, this is just one of the four other buttons. And it has an image or photo of Barack and his family. Perhaps this conveys some warmth, some sense of feeling of love and warmth. Uh, that people care about, right? So this works the best for his campaign. But even the e-commerce portals where we do the shopping from Amazon uh, to um, uh, Taobao or even the, the social media that we use like TikTok or whatever, there are always um, uh, experimental campaign or uh, experimental methods being conducted again and again to know which one works better. So it's just some key terminologies here. When we talk about comparison of groups uh, in experiments, you're always interested in comparing two or more groups and you are looking at the mean value, right? And second part, you're interested in how the treatment group differs from the control group. Does the treatment group have a better outcome, more favorable results than the control group? So this is what we are most interested in. Um, there's also a talk, some conceptual about correlational versus causal. We have talked about this in the previous lectures, but basically 
an experiment you're interested in seeing that the changes in your dependent variable is because the changes in the dependent independent variable that you have manipulated. Because an experiment, you can manipulate the independent variable in order to change the dependent variable. This is something where survey and other types of quant quantitative methods cannot do. Because only in experiment that you can manipulate the changes of this independent variable by making it higher or lower, higher or lower, so that you can see how is this affecting the dependent variable, but it goes higher and lower as well. Of course, whether you can get a truly, uh, purely uh, or real experiments or not in social science, that's another issue to talk about. And it also depends on a number of different factors, such as whether you can do a purely random, purely randomized, randomized people into, into a certain groups that you are testing or not. Causality is the holy grail of experiments. So an experiment, your purpose is to show that the changes in the outcome or dependent variable is because of the changes in the independent variable that you are manipulating. In the context of survey, you cannot manipulate the, the, the independent variable. But in the context of doing experimental research, you want to manipulate this with a particular purpose because you want to see if I change this independent variable, how does it change? the outcome variables. So there are certain conditions for causality. First, the X and Y, the independent and dependent variable must co-vary, which means that they must have a correlations or relationship. So that is the baseline, first baseline of information about causality. The second, the changes in X must happen before the changes in Y. For example, if you, if you want to know whether a four days week, four days, work week, like working four days per week will make workers to be more productive and you want to see the outcomes of this productivity, right? Then the four week work policy must be implemented first, right? And after it's been implemented, then you can measure the changes in terms of the productivity before and after. So the changes in the intervention or change in X must happen before Y. So this is the temporal order. You cannot do it the other way around. And thirdly, you are trying to ensure that there is no other variables apart from X that is causing the changes in Y. Of course, there can always be other variables such as a mediating variable, such as a intervening or moderating variable that affects the X and Y relationship or other confounding variables. But the purpose of, causa uh, purpose of testing causality in experiments, you want to ensure that the changes in Y is only caused by X. So we have talked about this correlation. Why is correlation different from uh, causation or causal analysis? In correlation, you only show the two variables are related, right? And this relationship doesn't tell you that this precedes this, or this happens, X happens before Y, or Y happens because of X. You, you cannot know. When, when you have a correlation, it doesn't tell you which cause which. It doesn't tell you that information, right? Because which cause which could also be influenced by another variable like Z or A or B. So, so um, correlation is a more a simpler type of relationship. So the next part is um, while in causality, you want to know that the changes here is because of here, and hopefully there is no other variable that that is affecting the main outcome variable. And that really depends on the, on the theory or the research model that you're using to do the testing. So there are at least three major types of experiment that I will cover here. The first is called laboratory experiment. Now, laboratory experiment is the most common type of experiment used by scientists and engineers. So when you think about people in developing uh, new medicines, people who are developing new materials, uh, you know, new type of nanomaterials or people who are experimenting with uh, aeroplanes. I like to use aeroplanes because it's easier to explain. You need to control everything so that there's no other factors that will affect your experimental result. Think of, for example, you are testing a new aeroplane. When you're creating a new aeroplane, you will test it inside the tube, inside uh, a chamber, right? And you throw in or you blow in air or even with some 
smoke and color smoke. And you can see how your model airplane is behaving with the air. So with that context, everything is constrained, everything is controlled. So that's why the result will be very, very precise. However, in social sciences, when we talk about lab experiment, we don't talk from that sense. Typically lab experiment happens in a room, in a cubicles, in a, in a computer in which you ask your participants to do some tasks, right? perform some tasks. This, this is called lab experiment. So lab experiment is good because you can control those external factors that will affect the result, the validity or reliability of your experiment, but it is not so real. It's not so real because people's behavior is real in the real world, not, not in the lab. Sometimes just because you bring in people into the lab, you are already altering or changing their behavior. Just because they know that they walk into your room to do experiment, they have already changed their behavior. They have already changed their perception, changed their identity. So that's why lab experiment is not really good in capturing realistic results, which will affect the external validity of the findings or the generalization of the findings. We're going to talk about it later. So this is one example that I'll show you that uses lab experiment. And I love this because I think it's a, a really great study and the result is super interesting. So, you know, people have been talking about, um, uh, you know, the, you know why, why people become greedy. So this, uh, this bunch of scholars by Wang and friends, they wanted to know whether people who are exposed or have, or have taken economics courses in their study, will these people be more greedy than other students who have not taken economics courses. So basically they come up with two groups that they're trying to test. They randomize the students who have taken economics major or have studied a number of economics courses versus social science students who are studying or majoring in education, right? And they play two games, uh, the, what they call dictator game. So in the dictator game is a money allocation. Test. So, so you, you give people a real money or hypothetical money and ask the person to keep or to give away the money. So in this under, unrestricted game, the, the, the player can choose to keep the whole money, like say $10 that they use, or, or, in the under, or in the restricted game, they need to partially give away, right? So in our restricted game, the, the player has full control of how much he wants to keep, how much he wants to give away. And every person get $10. So see, look at the mean value. In this study, economic student, on average, which is the mean value, keep $7.8 to themselves, but education students only keep 6.26. You can see the difference. So economic students keep more. So they are, this is an, an indication of being more greedy towards a particular economic resources, right? If this is using actual money, it's more interesting, right? And then you also have the restricted one in which the, but the players need to partly give away some money, they cannot keep 100%. So still the result is higher 7.72 for economic students compared to 6.74 for education students. And you can total up for all tasks and, uh, and tally up for all students. So then they did t-test analysis just to compare. And they want to see, for example, so they can show, for example, economic students kept $7.8, Education students kept six point two six student, uh, six point two six dollars, and the t statistics with one hundred and seven degrees of freedom, which is the sample size minus one, equals to three point six six. So this is the result that you can produce using SPSS or any software, and it's significant with p less than zero point zero one, and with the effect size of cons d at zero point three three. So this shows that there is a significant difference between economic students' behavior compared to education students behavior in terms of greed. So this is how um, uh, the, the, the researchers is using lab experiment to conduct this. So the students have to go into the lab and, and play this dictator game, a manual allocation game in the computer. And this is the kind of findings that they got. I also put together uh, two other experiments, examples in, in YouTube videos that I hope all of you will have a look. So the one on my left is experiment with monkeys. So it's very interesting. They want to know whether animals will perceive fairness or unfairness or not. So they bring in two identical monkeys and ensure them that you, they put them in a cage that way they can see each other. And they have two monkeys in which one of the monkey 
the researcher give a lot more grapes and fruits, while the other one get a lot less. And please pay attention to what happened to the monkeys on the left, on my left. He would be very angry. He was like, uh, he's throwing things at the researcher. Please watch it so you get a sense of what it is. The one on the right is a study on altruism, which is people's tendency uh, to do good to other people. So they want to know whether um, people have this sense of ten altruism towards strangers, the people that you have never, never met before. So they tested on a very young kids, like uh, just like one year old or less than two year old. And then uh, the researcher, the man who wears the red shirt will carry books and he will pretend to drop the books to the floor. And they want to see the reactions of this child. And the lady on that side is the mother because you are testing this on uh, doing an experiment on young children, you need to have their parents' consent and the parents has to be there so the kids feel comfortable, right? So it doesn't change the kids' behavior. So they make this as natural as possible and they found the result that the kids are actually were really willing to help a stranger to pick up the books even though they don't know the stranger and and what is the purpose of this. Uh, so, so, so this is what happens in a controlled uh, setting. The second type of experiments called field experiment. We call this field experiment because it happens in the field, in the field meaning in the real world. So in the real world means it could happen, uh, the experiment could happen in the real company, in the real schools, in the real workplace, uh, in the real leaders in their work, um, uh, in the real hospitals, uh, in the real uh, public service, etc., etc. So in a field experiment, it's more realistic because you are doing experiment on a real people on a real life but it also has some problems because it's so real that there are so many other potential factors that could affect the validity and reliability of your findings because there are just too many things that you cannot control for example you are running experiment on the shop to see that what kind of message that you put on the shop will bring in more customers there can be many variables there that you cannot really control Right? Maybe it just happens that uh, you know the, the uh, three shops next to you is doing a big uh, discount and this will reduce the effectiveness of the experiment that you are using or the mall where you are, where this uh, shop is doing this experiment is uh, having a big event that everyone is going to the event but rather going going to this particular uh, shop's uh, experiment, right? So, 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 Felix, so different experiments have different plus uh, or, or pros and cons. So this is one example that I like to, to, to quote in terms of a field experiment. So the research is looking at people's behavior in terms of recycling, in terms of sustainability, right? Because this is an important topic right now. So, uh, and the setting is in a hotel. So when people travel to hotel, stay in a hotel, you can use the towels, right? So in a typical standard message, right? I, can, I think a lot of hotels are using this. They have this message that you hook it on the on the on the bathroom door or, or put it on the bed. You say, "Please reuse the towel, have safe environment." Blah, blah, blah. So this is a standard message, right? And 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 this is actually there will be people who are exposed to this as a control group. And there is another one called the norm message, which is norm means uh, the things that everyone should do. Every, the things that everyone agree are important that we all should do. So the norm message is trying to say how important it is, uh, you know, uh, reusing a towel. It can save lots of water, can save lots of oil and lots of detergent. So you can save a lot, right? Um, and they want to see which of this message will uh, increase people's tendency to use more of the towel, which is, which is using towel more than one time, right? So the result is what we show in the middle there in figure two. You can see that very clearly, people who are exposed to the norm message have participated like about 45% of them participating in the towel reuse. That means they will, they have used the towel more than once after they have been exposed to this norm message, the message that gives you this extra information. Well, the, 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 the norm one is receiving just a standard message. So this is a field experiment because it happens in the real life. They, do this in real uh, hotels, right? And they can uh, find different ways to randomize people who check in into the hotel to 
to go into the control group. Control group will see the standard message or to the treatment or intervention group who will see the norm message. So there's a good citation there, which is which shows you the original source of the article. Have a look if you want. Another one is called online experiment. Some, some people even call it online field experiment. A lot of experiments that you see, uh, if you click through uh, Facebook or even LinkedIn or others, are actually this type of experiment. So in this experiment, the, which is published in a top journal in public administration, the research is very interested in understanding whether charity that puts information that they are funded by the government, they want to know whether mentioning that the charity that is funded by the government will have any effect or not on the donator's willingness to donate to the charity, right? So they use Facebook to recruit a lot of people because Facebook is so amazing. It has very precise detail of who we are as individual users. They can know who we are and, and where, where, where we are related. So they can do this randomization in, very, in a very amazing way. So they are, they are doing this cluster randomization. So they created these three types of advertisements to, re, to, to, to get people to respond to them. The control one is just a very basic information. All of them look very similar, but just the tiny detail down at the bottom there is, that is different. Uh, in terms of the logo, the name of the uh, organizer for this um, uh, activity called the Rutgers Observatory of Food Banks, Feed the Hungry Food, so all, almost look the same. So the control is the simplest. And then the placebo has a little bit of extra information the treatment is the main one that the researcher is very interested in. So it has information about the government funded food banks. So that, that is the key keyword, right? So they want to see whether people really uh, behave in a certain way once they're exposed to these comp compared to the control and the placebo groups. And so they, they have a relatively large sample size because you can recruit a lot of people in Facebook. Of course, they need to pay for such experiment, right? And you can see that they collected the data and actually the data is not significant. And this give a conclusion that the government funding doesn't really matter. So this is just one example of how people do online experiment. Now, importantly in experiment, you want to have a control of your experiment. So when you have a control, there are a few ways to do this, to ensure that the changes in your outcome in a Y or the independent variable is due to the changes in the independent variable that you manipulate, that you are changing. So hopefully if you change it up, you're hoping to see whether this goes up or goes down, depending on your theory, or if you change it down and this go down or up, depending on your theory. So you want to see that this changed because of this thing, not this changed because of something else, right? And one way to do it is to use match groups. So when you have control versus control versus treatment group or intervention group, you want to ensure that they are as similar as possible in terms of, for example, their gender, their age, their income, their education level, where they live. So if you can make sure that the groups, the people that you randomize that go into the treatment group versus the control group to be as match as or as similar as possible, then that will reduce external variation or external factors that will change the result in Y, which is beyond what you cannot control. So if you can ensure match group, you have more control over the results of your experiment, right? The second is match pair. Match pair of observation is what we call within subjects design, which is you, you get the same person to take the experiments twice. So for example, uh, you take the person to take the first experiment and then you conduct the, the intervention on these people and you ask them to, to take the second experiment, to, to, to fill in the information again one more time, and you measure the difference. If the second time when you measure the results, the result is better than the first one or more favorable than the first one, so the result from time two is better than time one, then you can say, well, the change is, is very much because of the, the intervention or the treatment that I give in the middle, right? The third one is randomization. So randomization is super important uh, because it can reduce any unwanted Un, un, unwanted variables that could affect the results. And some people call this as confounding uh, variables. Control variable is also very important. Control variable means uh, there could be other factors that possibly contribute to your findings and you want to rule this out, right? For example, again, age, gender, um, uh, all kinds of things, uh, size. If you're talking about a company, the size of the company, uh, the type of the industry, 
uh, if it's individual, like how long you have been in that job. So, so it could be uh, those sort of things that would affect the results. So, so in, in, in that sort of sense, if you can rule out that a certain very basic information, such as those age, gender, and whatever, uh, are not really affecting the main part of your, your intervention and doesn't change the relation of the independent and the dependent variable that you are testing, then you are you have more confidence or more more confidence to say that you have better control of the results. So there are two types of validity here in experiments. The first is called internal validity. Internal validity means how much confidence that you know that what is going on, the mechanisms of X causing Y or X cause Y goes through an, another mediator or moderator is because of these things inside this experiment. So, so, so that's why lab experiment is very good in verifying the relationship among the variables that you are testing. But it, it's very poor in giving you the generalization or the external validity. So they give us, give us a, get us to the second one called external validity. So external validity is how confident are we that the results in this experiment, whether X cos Y or X cos Y is subjected to a mediate, mediated variable or a moderated variable, to an extent that this can be generalized to another context, right? So for example, if you have done field experiment on, I don't know, uh, 100 organizations, right? You will be more confident to say that these findings is, is applicable to other organizations. But if you are doing it in a lab experiment, Let's say you are doing it on 100 individuals, experiment on 100 individuals, and you, you play some game or you give them some training. You, you cannot be so certain to say that this result also applies to real humans outside. Again, internal versus external validity, very important. And there are different types of experimental des design that we're going to have a look at. The first is the simplest one called the pre-test and post-test with only a single group or experimental group. Right, so the key part is the the dotted the box with the dotted line there. So you 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 measure the group. So you have only one group, right? Experimental group, right? You measure the group before you give the experiment. So you measure, for example, the four days per week work policy. So now people talk about will will people be more productive if we work only four days per week? So you can let's say you have a random people that you have. Randomized people who participate in this study, let's say 1,000 people, you take every individual's score of their work productivity, right? And then you implement the four days work policy, four days per week work policy, and then you measure again six months later in terms of their work productivity. If the result of O2, the productivity after you do the experiment is higher than O1, then you have confidence that, you know, this experiment or the treatment, such as the four work, four day work policy, is good, is beneficial because it produces better outcomes. Things like that. So the 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 column on my right, bottom right there is the kind of data structure that you would have. So you can see the group. Everyone is in a treatment group, and you have a pre and post test score, and then you you can do the analysis. So this is just another example. If you want to know. Providing a certain course or certain training will increase a certain uh, ability for the students, right? So you can randomize people, give them a test, uh, give them a pretest score, and give, give them to take the test. You take the capture, the zero one, the O one score, and you do the experiment. You give them the the training, the course, and you you measure again at O two, and you want to know whether O2 is better than O1. Of course, if O2 is favorable than O1, then you can say, well, it supports the hypothesis that this training increased the ability of the students. Uh, of course, there are some issues with uh, internal validity for this type of experiment or the pre-post test with only one group. First is uh, testing effects. Because you don't have a control group for this type, the pre-test that you did may have Make it, may, may be able to inflate the result of your O2, right? Because people will learn from the pretest, especially if the question have some similarity between pretest and post-test. The second, it depends on what question, on how you use the question to ask the people, that can be what we call instrumentation effect. For example, in O1, you measure using yes and no answer, right or wrong answer, which is categorical. And then in the post-test, you ask people to 
you ask the participants, the students to answer A, B, C, D, E type of multiple choice. So this difference could 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 give you different results in terms of the the validity of the results, right? Or even the questions that you ask, right? If you use different questions, let's say use exam question about the English ability before and after. Even if you use exactly the same questions, they can still uh, you can see, you can capture the if the the full effect of this uh, intervention on the outcome. But if the questions are uh, not exactly the same, sometimes it's the difference of this question that you ask in pre and post that is contributing to the to the lack of validity of the results. It could also be because of some external events that affect people. This is what called history effects. For example, you are testing people pre and post, and during this period between the pre to the post between this something happened a natural disaster or people got sick or there's some serious thing happening to their life and this will affect uh, how they the result that they will provide to you and this may seem that your result is so good or so bad and if you don't know that there's these threats to this type of validity like history effects and they will affect your results. So it's good that we know these things, right? And it can also be maturation effect. Maturation effects refers to um, things get mature. People get older or people uh, learn more over time. They, they become more mature. And this could also affect the result. For example, uh, when you do this pre and post test on English ability, maybe the older students will do better because you know they're just more effective because they're older. The second type is called post-test with experimental and control groups. So how is this different from the previous one? The previous one, the previous one you have only one group, but you have pre and post, right? In this one, you have only one test, post-test, but you compare the experimental with the control groups. So you have the E group and the C group. E experimental group, C is control group. Look at the box in dotted lines, right? So you just randomize people into the experimental and the control group. For the experimental group, you do the exp you conduct the treatment or the intervention, and you measure the outcome on these people or organizations. For the control group, you don't do anything to them; you just ask them to fill in your questionnaire at O2, and you calculate the difference. You can calculate the mean value difference between O O1 and O2. Your expectation is always that the treatment or the intervention, the X, is has a better result than the control, right? So if your O2 has better result or higher result or more favorable result than O2, then it supports your hypothesis that your treatment or your hypothesis, alternative, help, alternative hypothesis uh, works, that, that the relationship between this IV and the DV or the, 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 the variable that you manipulate and the outcome is significant. And the null is that there's no relationship between this IV and DV and or the manipulation and the outcomes. And the data structure will also look very different. You have two groups, like treatment and control. Look at the bottom, my bottom right, and you have only one score. So this is another example to explain what I've just explained. There's also some threats to internal validity for this type of just a one-time one test with two groups comparing experimental with control group. One is selection biases. Uh, again, uh, you can try your best to randomize people into the experimental control group, but there can always be a bias. Who will be selected into the um, uh, experiment versus control group? And also there could be people dropping out that could affect the results. Now, the third one is called a pre and post test with experimental control groups. A lot of people love this and a lot of uh, research are using this. I, I do this, I use this a lot because I think it's more complete and it, it allows you to make better inferences, make a more uh, confident uh, conclusions from your study. Because you're comparing two groups and you're doing before and after, and in the middle, one of these groups, you give them the treatment or intervention. The key part is that dotted box is there, right? So you have in experimental group and control group. You Before you do the experiment, you capture O1, you catch O3 right, at the same time. You do the experiment on the experimental group while the control group do not, you don't do anything with them. And then depending on when you want to measure it, you measure it at the same time O2 and O4, right? And then what you're interested in is what we call the treatment effect. So you want to calculate 
how big is the difference between O2 minus O1, right? And then O4 minus O3. And you want to ensure that the, the sum, the total sum of the experimental results minus the sum of the control groups. You want to ensure that, you want to find that the experimental groups give you better results than the, the control groups. If your experimental group doesn't produce any better results, more favorable results than control group, then it means your experiment has, has failed because the, the experiment, the treatment that you do doesn't produce something better than the control, than the baseline. Another word for control is the baseline, right? So, so in the, and this type of experiment is very powerful. For example, you could, you could study the four days work policy, right? You enroll, randomize, and enroll 1,000 people to be a part of this experimental group and another 1,000 for the control group, right? You, you captured how much is their work productivity for each individual, 1,000 and 1,000 for experimental and control. And then for experimental group, you ex implement the four days work policy, while for the control group, you just live as it is, which is a five or six days work policy. And then let's say three months or six months later, you capture their productivity at O2 and O4, and then you do the comparison. And then that will give you a conclusion to what extent is your experiment works or not, right? So that is the beauty of experiment. And this is something that you cannot achieve using survey, right? In survey, you're capturing data as it is. You, because you're capturing the data based on the world as it is. And you have no way to manipulate or change that reality. But, but in experimental research, you are, you are the person who changed the reality. And you want to see if I change part of this reality, does the outcome change or not, right? So, so in experiment, you, you, are, you are part of making a change instead of just just observe, use observation data. So this is the further example. Uh, I have a study that you can have a look uh, that it was published recently. I was looking at the, the relative uh, improvements or the, the uh, how does the use of a new learning material such as comic compared to textbook in terms of changing people's self-efficacy and intention to be a social entrepreneur and other factors such as you know their passion, right? So I, we cut we 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 have two type of learning material: comic versus textbook, and we calculate the difference between uh, the pre and post uh, for the self-efficacy of the people who fill in the question on self-efficacy and pre and post for the intent. So people who have read uh, the, uh, the 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 comic uh, will see. How is that affecting or influencing their self-efficacy uh, and also their intent, et cetera, et cetera? Have a look at the paper. Of course, the pre-post that we control, uh, experimental control group have also have some uh, issues. For example, people can drop out. So drop out is always a problem in, in, in the study to have a pre and post uh, study. There's another type of the Solomon for group design, which is more like a combination of the two previous types. One is the pre and post with experiment and control, and the other one with only post study with with uh, post only with the uh, uh, experimental control group. So they combine together. So this is much more complicated, but we will not cover this. But you can have a look if you have interest. Uh, the other issues is more like ethical issues. So if you are doing experiments, you have to be careful in terms of explaining explaining to the researchers what they will benefit from this research and ensure that their rights and their well-being are protected and how you will be protected and importantly to get consent, particularly if you are doing some lab studies. This is not so much of a problem uh, if you are doing social sciences research because if you are doing research that put needles or put uh, equipment into people's head and could change people's mind or you are injecting some medicine into people's body um, uh, or something like that, you know, you, you would have to go through relatively uh, a stringent uh, ethical approval procedures by some experts. Like in the university, if you're conducting uh, this type of research that will alter people's mind or putting something inside people's body, you need to have a very, very serious uh, or stringent approval. The other type is deception. Can you tell your research experiment participants 
the whole truth about your experiments. Sometimes you don't want to tell them the whole truth. You only to tell them part of the truth because you're worried that you will bias them. Just because sometimes you tell them the whole truth about what you want to find out in this experiment, your participant will already change their behavior because they want to please you. Because they want to please you that your, their activity, their participation will help you. Or sometimes even researchers pay by people to participate in the experiment. So they want to please. So this will create a bias and this is not good for, for research, right? And sometimes, um, oftentimes you need to explain and debrief the people, the participants after the study. If you don't tell them the whole truth, you still need to tell them after the experiment is completed. Uh, protecting the subjects is also very important. You need to get them to sign a consent form that they are willing to participate because this is important because if there's some problem later, um, you will be protected, right? And you have a way how to debrief the results or the, the experiment to them. And also you need to tell them how you keep their data confidential. Of course, in experiment, you are not doing interview. If you're doing qualitative research, you capture every person in very detail. And you, when you tell, when you report the findings, you, you, you're still at a very concrete level. But for quantitative research, whether it's survey or even experiment, you are not interested in every individual. You're interested in the group, in the average of the group, right? So, but still you need to protect the, the confidentiality of the individuals who take part. For example, who will have access to this data of this participant? Um, can people change this data? Uh, where will they store the data? How long will they store the data? So these are the very important part. And also privacy, like to what extent you ask for this detailed information. For example, I know that there are some researchers that are studying uh, using people's uh, health data, right? For example, you're studying uh, why people have a bone fracture at a certain age, right? And you go to the government, department of health, departments of health, to get this information. Uh, the government will not give you the whole data about each individual and all of their sickness and illnesses. They may give you a very small set of data, but you need to be very careful in terms of what data you can access and what data you can, you can find. And also you need to ensure that the data that individual from the participants that you collected are well protected. You also need to protect sometimes the sponsor of your research or the client of your research. Some, sometimes you cannot tell who is paying for this research. You cannot tell the true purpose of this research. Sometimes you cannot uh, uh, give away uh, the data that the sponsor have paid you to do. So there are a number of, depending on the terms and conditions of your research. And importantly, you as a researcher, it's important to protect yourself. You don't want to take the risk. You could, you could be legally liable if you have done something that would cause an injury or a, a, a negative loss to the participants. And if they sue the researcher, then this could be a problem. Right? And this way it's very important that the researchers know the, the uh, you know what they can or cannot do and how to how to do things in an uh, ethical manner. I stop it there for the lecture and uh, the next part will be the section two on uh, how do you compare means and uh, dif uh, group differences. Thank you.